And us there on the podium in the back, that might be helpful to It will be, actually. I'm sure of it. I'll try that as far as volume. Can you still hear me okay? Chris, can you hear me in the back? Yes. Got your attention anyway. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into statement number 11 of our 12 statements on the study committee report on human sexuality. So let me pray, and then we will continue. Father, in these next few moments, would you, by your kindness, be with us? Would you, in mercy, be here and give us insight into your word, insight into our own experience and the experience of other people, so that we might love them well, that we might honor you, and that we might display your glory in this world. So help us to think your thoughts after you in these moments. Be near to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So statement 11 is our topic for the day, friendship. Uh, this statement introduces some ideas to us that uh, some of us may be unfamiliar with and not realize were a thing. As it were. So to get us there, maybe, get us into that space where we can imagine maybe what is being considered in the, this statement on friendship. Uh, imagine yourself to be alone. Many of us understand very intimately the experience of loneliness. can latch on to in your own experience, your own mind and heart, a, a time when loneliness was your experience. Maybe it was a, a brief passing experience, maybe it was a, a longer term season, maybe it is the prevailing sentiment of your life, feeling alone. We know that that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone, right? It's the first thing in creation when God, after God had made all things, the first thing that God said was not good. The experience of loneliness. It's not the way it's supposed to be. We were meant for relationship. We were meant to be with other people. We are meant not just to be superficially with other people, but significantly, intimately even, in relationship with other people. So when we experience loneliness, it's painful, because it's not the way it's supposed to be. Now we know that ultimately in Christ, it's not how things are, because Jesus comes to us and meets us and cares for us and is taking us to an eternal glory where we will be with all of God's people and with God himself forever. And so we know that it's, loneliness is not our end state. But a lot of us experience it in this state. Now imagine if, and there are a lot of reasons why we can feel lonely. A lot of situations that can put us in a position where we're alone, feel alone. Now imagine for a moment that you struggle in a particular way, that you struggle sexually. And in the Christian church, we historically haven't done a great job, at least in the last number of decades, dealing with or helping sexual strugglers. There have been a lot of different attempts, but by and large, we haven't done a great job. And so for those that struggle sexually, as Christians, followers of Christ, that want to love Jesus, want to honor Him in all things, 
being a sexual struggler in the church can be a particularly lonely place to be. Many wonder if they're the only one. Maybe they assume, I'm the only one that struggles like this, whatever the this is. I'm the only one. It's terribly lonely. Now, on the other hand, there is a culture outside the church that embraces all kinds of sexual perversions, praises them, says they're good, and it's how things should be. How you feel is what's good and right. Now imagine the difficulty for a Christian who loves Jesus and wants to honor Jesus to live in that space. To live in a church in which they feel lonely. But in the midst of a context that would welcome them gladly. All you have to do is let go of your convictions about what true sexuality It's a tough spot to be in. So for many in our culture, and even especially those within, within the church, struggling with homosexuality, struggling with same-sex attraction, wanting to love and honor Jesus with all that you are, is a terribly lonely place to be. Hidden. And then set within the context of a culture it says, if you let go of that biblical sexual ethic business, we will welcome you gladly. We will celebrate you. It's a tough spot to be. So there are those that have struggled with homosexuality, same-sex attraction, who have sought out within the Christian community various forms of friendship. Sometimes this is taken the form of a committed relationship with a member of the opposite, with a member of the same sex that does not have the romantic aspect. In an attempt to assuage the loneliness, it's oftentimes it makes sense to gravitate towards someone who struggles in the same way that you do, because they understand. You don't always have to explain yourself and you feel like you're justifying yourself. You don't necessarily feel on the outside quite so much. So there are those who have established these relationships, these friendships. Now the culture says that, just calls that marriage. Just have at it, same sex, do whatever you want, we'll call it that. <coughs> But as Christians, we want to say, no, there's, God has a better design, a different design, but how do we think about friendship? How do we think about relationships for people that, that struggle with homosexual desire, struggle with same-sex attraction? How do we think about relationships for them? Um, and that's some of what Statement 11 is getting at. So for, for some of us, we, it was new to me that there are Christians who enter into these sort of committed relationships, but they try to keep them void of anything sexual. Um, but it is, what's the wisdom of that? Um, and is there something, is there a way that we as the church, <coughs> is there a way that we as a church can engage better with strugglers? Statement 11. Again, building on all these previous statements about identity and Christ is an original sin. Statement 11 on friendship. We affirm that our contemporary ecclesiastical culture, ecclesiastical is the big word for church, our contemporary church culture has an underdeveloped understanding of friendship and often does not honor singleness as it should. The church must work to see that all members, including believers who struggle with same-sex attraction, are valued members of the body of Christ and engaged in meaningful relationships through the blessings of the family of God. Likewise, we affirm the value of Christians who share common struggles gathering together for mutual accountability, exhortation, and encouragement. Now, 
Nevertheless, we do not support the formation of exclusive, contractual, marriage-like friendships, nor do we support same-sex romantic behavior or the assumption that certain sensibilities and interests are necessarily aspects of a gay identity. We do not consider same-sex attraction a gift in itself, nor do we think this sin struggle or any sin struggle should be celebrated in the church. So on one hand, this, this statement is seeking to address the practice of some to form these uh, marriage-like friendships to deal with the loneliness and, and help and um, seeking to be faithful to Christ. The committee's trying to help us understand that's not the best way to do this, but also to help us build a more robust view of relationship and friendship within the church generally. Because we all need friends. It's not good for any of us to be no matter what your sin struggle is. And so part of what this statement is trying to do is help us develop a more robust view of friendship, but to keep it within the bounds of what godly friendship looks like. I've included in, the, in your handout three pages from the Fuller Committee Report they're really, really, really helpful. So the three pages that I've included are an excerpt from the second of the three larger, uh, or the three articles that come after the preamble and the 12 statements. Uh, those articles tend to be kind of almost scholarly, but they contain some really, really helpful insight into how do we flush this out. So. A number of the concerns that we've been talking about over the last number of weeks, especially, a number of things that you, questions you have asked, have been leaning toward and kind of leaning into the, yeah, what does this look like? How do we do this in, in, practical, uh, in practical life? Um, and the, the second article in the Fuller Report is all about giving pastoral, giving biblical counsel for how to apply these principles. Um, and so it I thought about just copying that whole thing, that, that whole second article, um, and giving it to you. But the full report is available on the, the website that's listed there at the bottom of your handout. Um, but I do think that these three pages um, are a very helpful, very practical guide for thinking about this particular issue of friendship and singleness, and how do we love and support as the church, how do we love and support folks within the church that struggle with same-sex so depending on how things go in the next moment, maybe we'll get to those three, uh, to those three pages. Um, but on this topic of friendship, I'm going to pause and ask for your input, your questions, your thoughts or comments uh, before we maybe consider some of the practical outworking of or pra practical application of how we can do this. Questions on the statement itself. John, back and back. Yeah, I, I think what's going on there, the line, the second paragraph, lines two and three of that paragraph. Can you repeat uh, John's question? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. Um, John asked about the second and third line of the second paragraph. Uh, Nor do we support the assumption that certain sensibilities and interests are necessarily aspects of a gay identity. Um, I think some of what's going on, what they're after there, is the thought that um, if a guy likes flowers, he's gay. If, if, 
um, a woman likes to dress in a certain way, she's a lesbian. Um, that there are these certain aspects that uh, necessarily mean mm. if you, you feel that way or you think that way, you're necessarily homosexual, um, is I think what, what's after that. So, um, yeah. Is that? Yeah. Give some shape to it. Other questions on the statement itself? I think it's also hard to address the fact that that's not synonymous with synonymous. Those are different synonyms. Th those things aren't necessarily synonymous with the gift of singleness. Thank you. Yeah, that that is part of what is being addressed more more broadly in the statement is that there are those who are who have been gifted by God with the gift of singleness, and that isn't necessarily tied to same sex attraction. It, it, God, in his providence, gives some that gift. Um, and then how do we value, how do we, as the church, think about um, those that have the gift of singleness? Do we love them well? Do we recognize they're just as valuable in the midst of the body of Christ as anybody else? Rebecca? Yeah, and that, so Rebecca was talking about, mentioned Rosaria Butterfield. Um, thank you. So Rebecca mentioned her first book, um, Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, uh, which has some powerful reflections on um, the Lord's rescue in her life. Uh, but then her second book, I think, is footnoted somewhere in, in, uh, in recent paragraphs. Um, the gospel comes with a house key uh, and the role of hospitality in, um, in particularly uh, loving um, those that struggle with same-sex attraction, those that you would want to, to minister to. If we're at, and actually this gets into some of what's in the, in the three pages that you might read for a minute, but um, if we as believers, if we're going to tell people that struggle with same-sex attraction, don't go into the gay lifestyle, don't do it. We've got to provide them with an alternative, right? I mean, it's like, if we're going to say to the culture, don't kill your babies, what's the alternative? We'll take it. Right? And this is what the church has always done. We, we don't just decry what the culture's doing, we provide the counter-narrative. We demonstrate what goodness and beauty and truth look like. Not just we say that's bad, but we'll take, we'll do it. We'll do what needs to be done. So, you know, it's not just enough for us to say to uh, those that struggle with same-sex attraction, uh, don't, don't get, don't go into that lifestyle. We've got to say, come into the church and we'll show you what relationships look like. And, and we'll love you and we'll be loved by you. Rebecca, there was something else you said that I completely missed. What was the second half of what you said? That marriage is beautiful, that marriage is effective. Thank you. Um, she's a she's a sad person, and so marriage doesn't doesn't block away. Yeah, yeah. The the idea that oftentimes within the Christian church, our answer to someone that struggles with same sex attraction is just get married. Marriage is great. Um, but that doesn't, just because someone's gotten married doesn't mean that all their, I mean, good grief. I mean, Sarah and I tell premarital couples that, look, when you're engaged, struggling physically, is that's really difficult. <clears throat> but don't think that just because you get married, all your sexual struggles are going to go away. In many ways, it just, in some ways it gets worse. 
Um, so marriage is not the end-all, be-all answer to all sexual or relational struggles. Um, so we need to be, as, as believers, we need to be careful of how we counsel and what we expect. Like, oh, this, this guy was gay, but he got married, so everything's good now. Like, the struggle's over. Um, hmm? Not necessarily. So we, we need a more robust view of, um, of the struggle and of what it means to be human and of what sanctification is so that we, we don't fall into that same error of um, putting a weight on marriage and that, that it isn't that way. Other questions on the statement? Okay. I, I do want us to wade into these uh, a couple of pages uh, from the Fuller Report. Oh, there's the Rosary Butterfield quote. I knew it was there. So the bottom of page two of your quote of your handout. Um, <coughs> Rebecca did not serve on this committee, um, just so you know. But maybe she was consulted. So I'm going to read this. I don't mean to insult your intelligence. Please don't take it that way. But my sense is if I just hand this to you, it may just find its way to the trash can, which is fine. And I don't. But I don't want us to miss together some of the richness of what uh, our denomination has said. Yeah, this is really good. Okay. So stop me at any time. Uh, if, if I'm reading, I don't see your hand. Just clear your throat or call out my name or something. Because I want us to be able to talk through this as we go. It's a sad reality that some Christians in our churches who experience same-sex attraction have found limited support and encouragement in their desire to follow Christ. While the reasons for this reality vary, one of the most critical components of faithful discipleship is a deep-rooted connection in a local body of believers who can provide challenge, encouragement, and a strong sense of belonging. That's just a profound sentence for any follower of Christ, right? And I think we can all go, yeah, that's really important. For many of you, that's why you're at Harvest, because you found here brothers and sisters in Christ that help you follow Jesus. We ought to grieve any time a person who experiences attraction toward the same sex finds a greater welcome and a belonging in the secular LGBT community instead of the church. Now, for some of us, we may think that's a stretch. But it's not. Oftentimes, same-sex attracted strugglers find greater welcome in the LGBT community than they do here. Um, and that's sad, and we ought to grieve that. Having noted the potential dangers of expressions or emphases that could establish one's primary identity or community on the basis of one's sexuality, so that, that's what we've done in previous statements, right? We're not going to ground our identity in our sexuality in any form of our sexuality, right? Our identity is grounded in Christ. Then one of the most important questions that believers experiencing same-sex attraction have asked in recent years is, where am I to find community? Where am I to find companionship and belonging in this journey of discipleship? All too often, Christians have been very clear on the no of same-sex sexual relationships without then offering a plausible pathway to deep and meaningful community for which we were made. Believers who experience same-sex attraction often struggle with a deep-seated and crushing loneliness, a fear of never belonging to another human being. Churches must be committed to being communities of welcome for all sinners. For those repentant believers who know the struggle of same-sex attraction, our churches may welcome them not merely as broken people to be ministered to, that's the sense of condescension that a lot of uh, sexual strugglers feel. Not just people to be ministered to, but also as active and important participants and contributors, contributors in our communities. Like all yet-to-be-glorified Christians, those who struggle with same-sex attraction are commanded to walk with the Lord in faith and repentance. Insofar as such persons display the requisite Christian maturity, we do not consider this sin struggle automatically to disqualify some, someone for leadership in the church. Thoughts there? That, 
that's a pretty weighty paragraph, I feel like. Go ahead. Yeah, um, the, oftentimes our English translations, like First Timothy 3, um, the husband of one wife, um, and it speaks about his children, and, and Titus 1 speaks about Titus 1 talks about children following the Lord, not being open to, to various charges. Um, the language does matter. The, the Greek phrase is actually one woman man. Um, and most commentators historically have understood that to mean not necessarily married, but faithful. That he, that if he, if he is married, he's faithful to his wife. If he's not married, he's faithful in that in, in that state of, as being single. The problem, one of the problems with taking those commands about a man's marital. Uh, the problem with taking one woman man as meaning a man must be married and have children in order to be an officer in the church is then we lose Jesus, he was single, he didn't have any children. We lose Paul, who was single. We don't know any biological children from Paul. Um, and, and we, I mean, it, it just knocks off. Peter was married. We know that Peter was married because um, he had a mother-in-law. Um, but if we're if, if that necessarily requires that in order for someone to be an elder or a deacon in the church, they have to be married and have children. Um, that also then not only gets rid of Jesus and Paul and a host of other godly faithful ministers and, and elders and deacons, but it also then has it, it comes into conflict with Paul's teaching in Corinthians about the gift of singleness. And that if you're single, you should stay single. Um, some of that was given the moment to the, some of the things that were going on in the, in the Roman the Roman era, the Roman world at the time. But Paul's understanding of the body having being one body but with many parts, some of those are married, some of those are single, that loses a lot of its meat, as it were, loses a lot of its bite if there is really no place for, for single people. So I, I, I would say that we need to understand the language in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 as having to do primarily with fidelity and faithfulness, not necessarily with the state of being married. Um, and, and in some ways that ties to what Rebecca was saying. It's like now that you're married, you have a right to, to lead in the church. Well, that doesn't, it just doesn't follow experientially. Because I know a lot of married ministers that have no right being um, it has nothing to do with the marital state. Like it, it, it's so. Anyway, um, does that does that help? Um, that that is a it is an interesting phrase that Paul uses a one woman man, um, and it has been variously understood and interpreted. But the primary, the, the predominant understanding of that phrase is, is it has to do with fidelity and being faithful in, in the station. It's a good question because it does. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Okay, soldiering on here a little bit. Uh, bottom of page two. Our churches should seek to cultivate rich biblical friendships among people of the same sex. Regardless of whether a person struggles with same sex attraction, strong friendships with the same sex are important components of a healthy Christian community. And certainly, we have lots of examples of that biblically. I'll mention some of those here in the material. Far too often we act as though if a person is married, she or he no longer needs the same type of deep friendships that were needed before marriage, 
or that single people do. Friendship is the proper category for thinking of the type of close, intimate, same-sex relationships that scripture upholds. David and Jonathan, Jesus and Paul, Jesus and John, Paul and Timothy, each relationship was framed by an understanding of being committed to abiding friendship. Uh, and, and certainly there are attempts in modern secular scholarship to cast doubt on all of those three relationships, the nature of those three relationships just mentioned, um, and reframe them in an, with the homosexual understanding. Um, but that's us, that, that's called eisegesis, reading into the text, as opposed to exegesis, reading out of the text. So instead of letting the text speak for itself, we, our culture wants to read into the text our homosexual understanding and put it on any, any intimate relationship between two men. Because culture would say, clearly two men can't be close and not be gay. Well, the Bible teaches us something. Recently, some Christians who experienced same-sex attraction proposed celibate partnerships as a way of adhering to the traditional sexual ethic while retaining certain romantic elements of exclusive relationships. However, we find such practices to be unwise and inconsistent with the depictions of deep same-sex relationships in Scripture, which are instead cast in the context of familial and fili or filial relations. So filial there is coming off of word, the Greek word philos, so brotherly love, as opposed to eros, romantic sexual love. Um, so that, that's the, the framing of relationships, is brotherly love, philos. Scripture frames our relationships with fellow believers as familial, part of the family. The church is a place to be, a uh, place to love and be loved, a family in which to grow. Friendships can be deep and abiding. They are not by nature romantic or exclusive. The attempt to retain aspects of the marital relationship in the context of celibate partnerships is fundamentally a category mistake. It seeks to have aspects of romance or marriage without its fullness. Instead of rightly rooting this type of deeply caring same-sex relationship in its proper relational category of family, there's a lot here, part of why I printed this out for you so you can take it home and, and review it later. The attempt to bring aspects of the marital relationship into a non-marital relationship is itself a violation of the seventh commandment. While it's beyond the scope of this report to simply sort out the specific lines between expressions of marriage, family, and friendship, at its core, these questions are issues of the heart and motivation. Mature believers should seek honest self-examination and wisdom of others as they seek to remain faithful to the commandment. Pause there for questions and thoughts. Our churches must be places where single people who are called to a vocation of singleness or who are simply currently single can find deep and meaningful community. <laughs> if they are to be places where those who are persistently attracted to the same sex can find belonging. So in order for same-sex strugglers to feel like they have a welcoming place in our churches, the report is saying that we need to foster in our churches contexts of deep, significant relationships between people of the same sex. Um, so fostering and having men's groups, right, that get together and talk about the Bible and their struggles and are honest with one another and where these men respect one another and can be uh, vulnerable with each other. Ladies Bible studies where, where you can <coughs> wrestle with the Bible together and get together outside of just the formal gatherings. These are the kinds of things that uh, we want to see more and more of um, that demonstrate the, the commitment to one another and the commitment to discipleship together, fostering these sorts of relationships. We praise God for the places we see them happening. Um, I'm so delighted with the, the work that the Lord's doing in our midst, developing friendships. And y'all do that well with one another. And so I'm, this is, I'm not reading this by way of rebuke, um, but just expanding our maybe our vision a little bit to see understand maybe more broadly how the things that we're already doing, fostering relationships, 
can be used further to advance God's kingdom in a particular community. Singleness should not be treated merely as a problem to be solved. For some, it is a vocation from the Lord whose expression in the service of the church provides resources that our churches desperately need. The church ought to be a place which proves to be a spiritual family for single people, part of the cure for the loneliness of the single body. The confession rightly cautions against entangling vows in the single life in the larger one of 39. Nonetheless, Christians with same-sex attraction who are pursuing chastity yet do not experience attractions to the opposite sex may be properly considered continent. And may very well have an indefinite or lifelong call to singleness. So this is some of what Rebecca was getting at, that just the, the answer to same-sex attraction isn't necessarily get married. Not everybody who experiences same-sex attraction as a follower of Christ necessarily gets rid of those attractions over the course of his life. It's a faulty view of sanctification that, make, that allows us to think that, that necessarily the sinful desires that you have in this life are going to go away entirely. They may. I mean, there are alcoholics that come to Jesus and put the bottle down and never pick it up again and never desire to drink. That's pretty rare. The normal way of sanctification is that we continue to struggle with sin patterns, but we repent more quickly, we trust Jesus more deeply, and over time we do see a lessening of those desires. And it may be in the Lord's kindness and providence that those desires get squashed, but you can go 15 years without a desire to drink, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there it comes. So we, our hope is not in the elimination of these desires. Our hope is in Jesus. And as we press into loving Jesus and being loved by him, those sinful desires, whatever they may be, do lessen and decline over the years. But we don't have the expectation that they'll necessarily go away. So there are a lot of folks that struggle with same-sex attraction that, follow, that love Jesus and want to honor Jesus for whom those desires never entirely go away. And they certainly don't necessarily find themselves attracted to the opposite sex. Does that mean they have no role in the kingdom? Of course not. The perspective that only biblical resolution of same-sex attraction is marriage is not a consensus perspective that can be proven from our standards, nor does it seem to give proper regard to the rights and dignity of both parties in the marriage relationship. So that, hypothetically, let's say the situation is you have a man who's struggling with same-sex attraction, his church is telling him he should get married, he finds a woman, she agrees to marry him, and then they never have sex? That's not good for marriage. I mean, he's never attracted to his wife? Is that what marriage is for? <laughs> think so. While marriage is one remedy for preventing of uncleanness, pastoral wisdom dictates that we are sensitive to the fact that single persons often remain unmarried for a variety of understandable reasons. When a single person embraces the gospel advantages of being single, this is a charisma that is a gift given by the Spirit for the edification of the church. Regardless of whether the singleness of our people is temporary or persistent in this life, the eschatological understanding of our sexuality recognizes that in the new heavens and new earth, marriage will give way to a union of even greater intimacy with God and the communion of saints. Consider the fact that in the new heavens and the new earth, if you're married, you will know other believers better in the new heavens and new earth than you now know your spouse. The intimacy of relationship that we will have with one another as saints in God's kingdom will be greater than any human intimacy experienced in this life now because of sin. That just boggles the mind. You see, the beauty of the gospel is that we get to lean into that even now in the church. It's a beautiful thing. 
Thus, single people in our churches can also help model this eschatological reality for us in their daily faithfulness to God and service to his people in the body of Christ. Scripture and our confession provide the core and essential resources for pastoral care of those who experience same-sex attraction. They give us unchanging theological principles from which we must care for those in our churches for whom this is a struggle. In many ways, the discourse around the various application of these principles in our particular cultural moment remains ongoing. So these are difficult realities that we've still got to keep working through and wrestling with, uh, which is part of the beauty of of our denomination putting together a report like this. It helps equip us for the, the ongoing work. We encourage our churches to hold firmly to the vision of Christian discipleship put forth in the scriptures and our confession while offering pastoral care to those whom we are called a shepherd in our particular context. Finally, we rejoice with our brothers and sisters who, while experiencing ongoing attraction to the same sex and living in a culture which would encourage them to embrace and act on those attractions, instead, they pursue lives of faithfulness through chastity and obedience to Christ by daily echoing Jesus' words of not my will, but yours be done with respect to their sexuality. In this, they model for us what it means to heed Jesus' teaching. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. May it be that thanks to the finished work of Christ and at the end of our sometimes faltering and imperfect obedience, we each hear the divine accolade, well done, good and faithful servant. That last power, that last paragraph is, I think, particularly challenging to Many of us do. For many of us, the thought that we have something to learn about following Jesus from a gay Christian, all right, I know, I know, I know, I know. We're not, that's not the right phrase. From a follower of Jesus who struggles with same sex attraction. That's humbling for many of us. Um, because we, I don't struggle that way. And the, the subtle sentence, the, I think this is the way we tend to think. Since I don't struggle that way, I don't really have much to learn from that person. I have much to teach that person. But I don't necessarily have much to learn from that person. But the good news of the gospel tells us that actually, yeah, I do have a lot to learn from people that struggle in ways different than how I struggle. Um, and the gospel not only teaches me that I can learn from other people, but it gives me the resource to be able to receive. It gives me the resource to be able to receive from others who struggle in different ways. It gives me the ability to love them by letting them love me. Letting them help instruct and teach me. Questions there on friendship? No. This is a comment on a question. It's a comment on a problem that um, I've heard someone saying I think I think oftentimes, for people who have struggled with this, uh, they have been around for years and years and years, so by the time that they come out as gay, they've already worked through this and decided that a biblical sexual ethic supports their own sexuality. At which point, I think, you're, you, you work alongside that person in a different way than you do somebody who comes along and says, hey, I'm struggling with this. Yeah. Christ, 
John's question was, oftentimes folks will struggle for years in silence um, within the church maybe, and then after years of struggling alone and silently come out kind of fully em embracing what our culture says is, is okay. Um, ministering to that person is different than someone who comes to you and says, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Um, someone who's earlier in the process of it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it requires a lot of wisdom to know what, what to, how to respond to anybody in whatever situation you're in. But the first thought that comes to mind, how do you respond to the person who's resolved in their own mind, who, who would say they're a Christian but is resolved in their own mind that God's good with homosexuality because that's the cultural narrative. The first response is, is grief. It's just, it's so sad. It's just so sad that we would, there's just so much to grieve through. Um, but then, you know, to, to what extent is that person, are they asking for input? To what extent are they wanting your help? Um, there may not be a lot that you can uh, do immediately with that person. I don't know, it's hard, you know, without this person. Yeah, there, there certainly are those that struggle in, in solitude for years. Um, and the only, oftentimes the only people that they're allowed to struggle with are people that have already embraced the LGBT lifestyle. Um, and so if that's all that you're hearing, is that this is good, this is good, this is good, and you should embrace this, embrace this, um, that's, your, that's, that's gonna wear you down. I mean, what, what do we expect? There are many things in our culture that are similar to that. You know, if, if all that we're listening to is one perspective and one narrative, it's going to shape the way we think. Um, and so we as, as believers need to foster the kinds of contexts where we can talk openly and, and discuss um, all sorts of things so that we can let the scriptures, which are true, which are the standard, uh, speak into whatever the issue is. I think this does provide some limited feedback, but I guess I guess a comment to that is for the consideration because in actual in practice, I think that's probably the most common scenario in which we find ourselves. Mm. Maybe because of the way historically we think about gay rights fostering yeah. this instead yeah. of the other that people can Yeah, so so there is kind of a two-pronged approach of where are we exactly in our historical moment? How do we deal with the people that are actually before us? But then also, how do we craft a better community moving forward that, that maybe protects us from getting to where we are, where we have been? Other questions here? Melanie? In, in the, the what? Say the first line again? In his image. In his image. love them, but that's the hardest thing to do, to love anybody. I mean, love is the hardest thing. Right, and, and that's the, the, the beauty of the counter narrative of the Christian church. We actually have what you're deeply looking for. Now, we as Christians don't always demonstrate that faithfully and, and very well. Um, but we do know that Jesus provides 
the deep provides for the deep longings of the human heart. And so being able to honestly address what those deep longings are in the other person, whether they're struggling with same-sex attraction, whether they're struggling with alcoholism, whether they're uh, gambling, debt, whatever it is, being able to get down to the heart, what's the heart, what are you after? What do you need? Now we can find out how Jesus meets that need. Now we have something. And, and that has to happen in the context of loving relationship, where we care, genuinely care for the other person. Um, it's not about being right. It's not about winning an argument. It's about helping them see the depth of the, the, the beauty of Jesus to meet the need that they have, which is a need that we all share. So we, we have to be able to identify the commonality of our human experience, even with people that struggle in completely different ways. Yes, last, last, last one. Sorry, Jeremiah. We're already over time, but we I'll take what you got. Depends on the. Yeah. It's going to address every um, wisdom, wisdom worked out in relationship. Um, and yeah, we're, we're not going to figure these things out alone. <laughs> I do know that. Um, we need each other, we need other people's experiences. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I, can't, I can't give you what you're looking for, but I don't really want to, I don't want to give you what you're looking for. Um, if it in any way circumvents our having to trust Jesus in those moments. Because there, there isn't a one size fits all, and I, I wasn't meaning to, Melanie. Please don't take it that I was laughing at you I'm talking about loving, but just that it's so hard to love other people that to me sometimes it's. And you said simply love them purely. That's what made me kind of go. I wish, I wish it was that easy. Um, but yes, the loving relationships in the con, loving wisdom in the context of relationships. Is the way to Father, add your blessing to uh, that which is good and what needs to be forgotten and uh, erased from our minds and hearts. Please do that work with your spirit. Help us to love well those that uh, you place in our path. And help us to be always cognizant and aware of our need for your love and your kindness in our own hearts. So would you, even now as we worship you in a few moments, would you apply the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of our risen Savior to the deep, longings of our own hearts so that we might be able to live with a clean conscience before you but also then we might be able to love others as you have loved us in Jesus name